Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to my talk today. My name is Joshua Helpern. I'm from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and I'm an intern here at Google. And today I'm going to be talking to you about video annotation, uh, the current uses of video annotation, the state of software and techniques that are currently in the research environment, and a framework that we researched and designed at uh, Illinois to help facilitate the video annotation process using technology, and then a set of tools, vCode and vData, that we built to demonstrate the feasibility of such a toolkit uh, following this framework. But before I can even really talk about what video annotations are and how they're used, we sort of need to take a step backwards and start thinking about the study of human behavior. If we go back hundreds of years, people have been studying human behavior in the form of anthropologists. During the time of the, uh, the West exploring and uh, under, uh, uncovering the world around them, they sent out anthropologists to different tribes, different communities and cities to immerse themselves, to find out how the different cultures work, to understand the roles of different people in those societies. And these anthropologists would take detailed notes in their sketchbooks, they would draw pictures, and then write about these, these experiences they, that they had to help uh, give other people an understanding of these different cultures, these different communities, and these different people uh, all over the world. People in behavioral sciences have also studied human behavior for hundreds of years. We can look at people in uh, speech pathology, uh, special education, even, the psycholo even psychology. People have looked and studied the way humans interact and use note taking to try to understand and convey the behavior of different people to others who are not there at the time. Ethnography has also been a vital tool in understanding human behavior in the workplace. Ethnographers have gone into work environments to understand the workflow, how, uh, where there are shortcomings, where there are problems, where errors can occur, and suggest ways to improve those work environments. Uh, one uh, paper that, uh, uh, that comes to mind is the paper of McKay, where he, he looked at the, uh, the role of paper in airplane, uh, air, air traffic controllers, and how paper was used as a redundant tool to help prevent planes from crashing in the sky, and so that all the different controllers could be aware of what each other are doing. Now, the, role, the study of human behavior has also come to computer science in the study of how people interact with software and web pages. Many, many uh, universities and also many companies have started to employ people in human-computer interaction, uh, CSCW, to come and work with them to try to understand how to make tools more usable, provide the features and interfaces that individuals want to interact with to allow them to complete their jobs faster and also collaborate with each other. Now, the normal process in, uh, these, in these domains uh, exists by a researcher conduct, conducting an experiment, uh, whether that is going out into the field or in uh, a situation at a university or maybe here at Google, uh, you would take some individuals, bring them into a room and videotape a session. Um, coders would then use video, uh, to perform some kind of analysis on that video, making marks about when different types of events occur. The, um, now, I'm talking here about annotations. The difference between an annotation and, per, per se, a transcription is a transcription is what a stenographer does in, the, in a courtroom. They're writing down the different words that are being said, something that could show up as subtitles. Whereas annotations is trying to capture specific marks, events that occurred throughout a, a session or an experiment. They would then perform some type of check for reliability to make sure that the marks that one person made actually occurred during that session. And then you would hopefully try to publish that data in a reputable journal or conference. Now, the role of video has evolved over time. And rather, if we look back at early types of study of human behavior and making those types of annotations, it's very different than what we find ourselves in today. At the beginning, people were using paper. Think about the anthropologists uh, from hundreds of years ago who would go out. All they had was a pad of paper, a notebook, and a pen or a pencil. And they would make these marks and make sketches. And then based off of the trust and, and strength of the, the observations that they made, they would be able to convey their observations to their peers in the scientific community. With the advent of video, this revolutionized the, the way that people approached, approached annotations and understanding human behavior. What they were able to do is now videotape a session and show it to every other peer researcher that they had out there. So now everyone could actually see the same events that were going on. If you provided timestamps for this video, then you can actually have people mark when events occur 
at a specific time and then compare those marks to see what the agreement of how many of these events, whether it's time somebody smiled, time somebody looked at a computer screen, time somebody said a specific word, and they can actually count how often they agree that these events occur. Now, with VCRs, that moved the entire world of looking at video 100 light years forward. Because suddenly, it became really easy for you to pause video, rewind, fast forward, slow it down. It made it much easier for people to do multiple passes. Consider the, uh, the older way, which was using a video reel, using celluloid film. You would have to rewind the film, slow it up, play it again. This was a very difficult process. But with VCRs, things became much easier. In addition, VCRs had actual uh, timestamps that were actually displayed now on LED screens of when, what time in the video things occurred. So suddenly, it was not an extra effort to actually include timestamps with the video. Suddenly, we're now able to look directly at the VCR, the playing device, and look at and actually be able to say, aha, this person smiled at 5 minutes 43 seconds into the video. Now, when the advent of uh, spreadsheets, Digital spreadsheets came out. This moved everything forward once again. Whereas before, people had to rely on pen and paper to make these notes, and that was one copy. Now people could make these, uh, these annotations in a spreadsheet, in a log file, where they could put dates, they could put the type of event that they observed, and maybe even some comments. Suddenly, backup was made much easier, and some of the basic things that came out, come out of using digital technology, like copy, paste, undo, made their lives much easier. Imagine having to write the word smile thousands of times over a video. Well, what happens if you could just press paste every single time? Well, that just makes everything move faster, makes it that much more easy. But when for checking for reliability, for to see whether or not two people agreed that events occur, well, people still had to print out these reams of paper with all of these notes and still go sit down in a room and go line by line to see whether or not people agreed that a certain event happened at a specific time. Computerized systems is the wave of the future. It is what uh, we are all striving to get to. Because if you think about it, computers have this amazing ability to just shortcut a lot of these problems that were currently going on by using paper and VCRs. By uh, using computerized systems, we can present synchronous uh, secondary data. So imagine if we had, let's just say, the volume. If we're looking at the, the, the way people are yelling or talking in a, in a room, we could present a waveform to discuss, to show uh, somebody the volume that's going on in a conversation. Or if we're looking at a technological domain, we could provide secondary data recorded or logged by, let's say, Eclipse when people are coding. You can then take that logged Eclipse data of interaction with button presses or keystrokes and present that to the user. So suddenly, not only do they have the video, but they also have the secondary data that they can also make uh, understanding and make conclusions based off of. So how many times when people click a button is somebody actually smiling? So now we can look at the smiles and the button presses together. In addition, research has shown that by presenting this secondary data, the quality of the results is higher. The speed that people are able to, and the confidence that they're able to make for these marks is that much higher as well. In addition, can, uh, computers provide a control me mechanism for us to do easy play, pause, rewind, some of the basic things that come together when you're using a VCR. But we can now get it much more accurate. With a VCR, you need to toggle with you know, maybe hitting the, space bar or the, the pause key at the right time or slowly go forward one frame at a time. With computers, it's become very easy for you to skip one frame forward, one frame back. In addition, computers have the potential to take care of these reliability calculations for us. Consider when you're using paper, somebody has to go line by line to see whether or not you agree. Well, if this is all digitally stored data, the computer can already automatically calculate, well, that you agreed 40% of the time, or 90% of the time, as we would hope for. In addition, computer streams also allow us to do multiple streams of data, uh, multiple video streams. So whereas in the traditional VCR mode, you would either have to have a lot of different monitors synced up at the same time, or pre-process the video so that you had two different video streams going at the same time on the screen. With a computer, you can take multiple, let's say, QuickTime files, sync them up together, and then alternate between them. Computers have an amazing potential to increase the quality and speed of this process. 
So I now would like to talk about some of the existing software tools that are out there to facilitate this video annotation process. Now, I'm not going to go give a full description of all the tools or all the different features that they have. This is just an overview. And what I would like to discuss is some of the uh, trouble spots that these existing tools have, have run aground on. The first trouble spot is the use of the timeline. Now, the timeline is a common uh, tool for video editing. If you look at video edi editing software from iMovie, uh, Final Cut Pro, they all have a timeline. It's an easy way that you can show different elements in a chronological fashion. As you can see in the first example on the left, Vaca, the timeline is condensed where all the different marks, the annotations, all exist on one uniform timeline. Now, this is great for us to get an understanding of seeing the relationship between those different marks. It's great for screen real estate. But if you've got many different types of annotations possibly occurring at the same time, it gets very confusing to actually differentiate between them. Now, Visita, or Mac Visita, depending on which operating system you're running, uh, is an alternative solution that goes in the exact opposite direction. They say every single annotation line, every single type of variable that you might want to look at, should occur on a separate line. Now, this is really great for us seeing the trends that occur within one, one specific variable. However, if you've got anything more than, let's say, 15 variables, you're going to have to start to scroll up and down. And the relationship between different different variables measured will be very hard to tell. Yes, it might be easy for the variable right above or right below that current track that you're looking at. But when you start looking four variables away, five variables away, can you really easily compare the, the marks at the top of that line to the marks at the very bottom of that window? It's very, very difficult. Another problem that many tools have is an overly complex interface. This is Nodulus Observer. This is the, what's considered like the premier commercial grade video annotation tool that's out there. As you can tell, there are a lot of windows up there that somebody who's making these video annotations have to, have to mitigate. But the question that I immediately have is, where are the annotation marks? Turns out it is that, top, that window in the top right. And they use video annotation marks as a list instead of viewing them on a timeline, which makes it very difficult for us to see the relationship between the chronological events in the video and the actual marks or annotations that need to occur. Now, they did a great job here by having multiple video streams. That solves a lot of our problems. But it, there are so many windows, you become overwhelmed with all the possible options that you have. Another downside of the Nodulus system is that the admin windows, the functionality that allows you to set the configuration for the video that you're annotating, is right up there coexisting with the, mark, with the, the areas that the annotator has to go through to make their marks. Now, this is a big, big problem. Because if, you have, if a researcher has set up a set of variables that you want to look at, you want to make sure that all of the annotators are looking at the exact same set of variables. So if somebody tweaks that control, that admin feature in the main window, that can have detrimental effects to the data that you're trying to collect. One of the best tools that's out there that's for free is called Anvil. Anvil has done an, a really nice job with many aspects of their interface, as you can see here. But they fall into the same trap that all of the tools that I have discussed have fallen into, which is actually meeting the needs of, of the researchers. If you actually spoke to researchers who actively use video data and video annotation, there's some major problems that all of these tools have run into. And we call this sort of flow, this sort of organization, this process that these, video that these researchers use the video annotation workflow. So step one is collecting the video. That's very simple. You run a research study, you set up a video camera, and you record it. Part two is creating the segments of the video to code, and uh, also creating the list of variables that you want to annotate, the dependent variables, if you will. Number three is training the coders. Now, this is a critical part of the process. You need to make sure that all of the video annotators that you are using to gather data all have the same mindset of what the different variables mean. For example, let's, let's say that we're looking at smiles. How many times somebody smiles when they're using a, a piece of software that we wrote? Well, what is a smile? I might view a smile as, you know, I've got my teeth showing and my cheeks are really high and, you know, I'm, I'm giddy like a schoolgirl. But somebody else might say, well, you know, if, you're, if you, the corner of your mouth is just slightly raised, I'm going to consider that a smile. Well, that's a huge spectrum and everything in between. 
So you need to make sure that all of the different video annotators have the same understanding of what those variables are. And you can do that by checking the reliability, showing them both a set of video, asking them to annotate a certain variable, and seeing how many times they agree. And if they've got a certain percent agreement, you can say that they're reliable. They have an agreement level that is reliable so that I can assume that the data that they produced is, is actually the events that are occurring. Now, that reliability variable is usually set somewhere between 75 and 80% agreement. Um, for my own personal research, I shoot for 85, uh, so that when there's fluctuations, they can fluctuate to about 80, so that you can still have a fairly reliable set of data. Number four is gathering the data. This is after you've demonstrated reliability across all your variables, you sort of release your coders to, to annotate all the videos that they can. And that immediately leads into number five, which is the weekly reliability sessions. Every week, researchers come together with their video annotators, have a video that they both, that all the annotators have looked at together, and checks and makes sure that the reliability is still there. We want to make sure during the entire research process, the entire annotation process, that we are still having a certain degree of reliability in the data that we produce. And when there's a problem, when let's say a variable is at 50% agreement, we want to go back to the video and look at and see how these, uh, where these differences and discrepancies occur. And lastly, we want to perform data analysis. So after all of the data has been collected, we want to be able to look at this data and figure out trends and actually perform the, the, the research analysis that would get published. Now, if we look at the existing tools that are out there, basically, they gather data. And they're pretty good at that. But when it comes to doing anything else, they're very, very difficult. Now, we can probably give them one and two. We can probably say, well, yes, these tools uh, allow an easy mechanism for you to import video that has already been collected. And maybe if you've got secondary data, some of the tools allow you to import that. But they have no methods for you to train coders, to demonstrate reliability. And they kind of deal with allowing you to export the data to a secondary piece of software. But what you're basically left with right now for doing this reliability is still exporting the data to a text file, printing out the text file, and going line by line with people in a room trying to figure out where these discrepancies occur. And much like the situation with VCR, if we find a discrepancy, we now need to queue up a videotape, find out exactly the timestamp that both you and I were looking at, and see and determine who is correct. So based off of this and discussions with researchers who actively use video annotation, we came up with a set of requirements of what an ideal video annotation tool should really do to fully facilitate uh, research. Step one is facilitating the coding workflow, which I just discussed. Number two is that the video, the annotations, and the guidelines, the descriptions of the variables, should be completely in sync. Because we're dealing in a digital domain, this should be really easy. We should be able to go and look from the video directly to the marks that were made about that video to the description of what those variables are and go back and forth really easily. Capturing appropriate data is something that a lot of tools actually already do. This means that sometimes we're looking at events. Let's say every time somebody says the word banana. That's an event. It occurs, and then it's over. So that's a momentary event. But then we have something, let's say, that is how often is somebody looking at the screen, and for how long? Well, that's a ranged event. There's a start and a stop, stopping point. So we should allow whatever tool that we build to have events that are momentary and ranged events. But in addition, we can also say, well, there are some times where we want to, let's say, look at the language that somebody is using. So somebody who's in speech pathology wants to look at the phonemes that are being produced in terms of their sound. Or you want to perhaps put a rating. So you say, well, we're looking at smiles, but I'm going to put a one value if it's a, you know, just your, the corner of your cheeks going up. And I'm going to give it a 10 if your teeth are showing and you're giddy like a schoolgirl. So what if you wanted to put those kind of ranking systems and associate those with your marks? So you need to facilitate comments and these ranking systems, ranged events, and momentary events. As I said earlier, secondary data should be able to be displayed. This improves reliability and quality of the results. Many of the tools that I've already discussed do have a form of showing secondary data. But this is a critical part in the digital world that we're working in today. This, one, this uh, requirement, allowing multiple forms of playback, is one requirement that is not met by any of the tools out there. 
Through conversations with researchers that we, uh, that we had and with coders, we discovered that it's not enough to just simply play a video from start to end, pause and rewind and fast forward. We found out that sometimes there's variables that are hard to sort of say when a variable actually starts and ends. For example, let's go back to that smile example. When does a smile actually start? Do your lips have to move a certain degree? Do your cheeks have to be raised a certain amount, of, like so many inches, so many millimeters? So what they've come up with is a system where you play a video for, let's say, three seconds, maybe five seconds, and then, it's, then you pause it. Then you say, in the past three or five seconds, did this event occur? and then you make a mark, and then you watch the next three or five seconds. Well, with a VCR, this is very troublesome because I'm going to try to pause three seconds later, but I might not be exactly right. Let's say I'm, I'm half a second off. And as I continue to get half a second off with every single three second increment, by the time I get to an end of, let's say, a two minute video, well, that's a major problem. Now, now the sections that I'm looking at and the sections that my, other, my coding partner are looking at are going to be completely different. So we should be able to facilitate both standard play and this interval playback mode so that we should make sure that coders, when they watch at three second or five second increments, that they're always watching the same chunks of video. The sixth uh, requirement should be that a tool should facilitate agreement calculations. This should be so obvious to anyone who's doing research is that you want the to go immediately from making these annotation marks to calculating what the agreement is between the coders. And because we're working with digital tools here, digital videos, digital marks, calculating that agreement automatically by the computer should be very, very easy. And lastly, when we're reviewing the marks, we want to easily go from the discrepancy that occurs back to the actual video. And we want that process to be so seamless that the researcher doesn't even have to think about queuing up the videotape. They can immediately say, aha, we had a problem with the variable smiles. So we want to go back to the video and see where coder A and coder B line up and where they differ. And then we can have discussions about why that occurred. To demonstrate that this framework could actually be built, we created a suite of tools called vCode and vData. VCode is the main interface that video annotators utilize. We try to simplify it as much as we can and provide them the functionality that they directly need. As you can see here in the main part of the video uh, of the VCode interface, we have multiple, uh, multiple streams of video, the main video as well as two secondary video sources. For example, if we have multiple camera angles on the research session, possibly if we're doing a screen grab, if we're capturing all of the screen information. This and then the coder can switch between these different video angles simply by clicking from one of the, the streams at, uh, to another, and the main video stream will be replaced. This allows the coder to have direct access to the best video source for them to make the most intelligent annotation possible. If they can't see the action that's going on in video angle A, they can easily switch to video angle B. As I mentioned before, facilitating multiple modes of playback is critical. And so we wanted to make sure that this functionality was in the hands of the coders. And if you look at the bottom corner of the screen, we provided a toggle switch to allow for, video, uh, for interval playback mode. In addition, there's also a text box that allows you to set the time interval, whether it's three seconds or five seconds, whatever it is. This allows the coder to have different, set different variables to be different interval lengths so that they can go back and forth between continuous playback or standard playback, and this, con this interval playback mode. The timeline is the heart of the vCode interface. And as you can see here, this is where we present a lot of information. At the top of the interface, we have ticker marks. This allows people to have a numerical uh, count in seconds of where they are in the video process. In the main part of the screen, we have all of the different marks. Now, you can see the momentary events are the individual diamonds uh, on the top half of the screen. And in the lower half of the highlighted area, you see the ranged events. Now, we found out that by combining and overlapping the, uh, the momentary events, we can still provide enough physical area for mouse interaction for moving the events around while still conserving screen real estate. But because the ranged events are a little bit more complex, that we're not just dealing with a, with a binary uh, event, a binary diamond, that we have the actual range to consider, you needed to put each of those on a separate track. 
But this is very efficient for screen real estate usage while still providing optimal opportunity to manipulate the marks. At the bottom of the screen, we also have secondary data. This, can, this is imported in through a text file with uh, a comma, comma separated text file. Uh, these marks can be displayed as a bar graph, as you can see in purple, a line graph, which is, shows up green on my monitor, but on the projecting screen shows up as blue, and uh, also as a uh, scatter plot, which is shown up in red. Now, in this example, all of these secondary data points are overlapped, but you have the option to actually have these separated into different tracks. So we keep the data right in line with the annotations and right in line with the video. Now, one of the most important things here is the difference between being able to make a mark um, that has, uh, the most important thing here is being able to attach those marks to the actual uh, variable that those marks are trying to represent. And in the right-hand corner of the screen, we have created an entire list, an entire panel of all the different dependent variables that we're trying to measure. On the left-hand side, you can see the different uh, keyboard shortcuts in the middle of the variable name, and on the right, you see two different toggle buttons. The first button is, uh, allows you to make a mark at the current uh, playhead, and the second button allows you to put that additional note that I was talking about, whether or not it's a ranking or it's the phonetical transcriptions. And if you choose to put a note, a, a window pops up, which gives you a free-form text area as well as the entire phonetic repertoire to facilitate any type of phonetic transcription that needs to occur during this process. And when you, put a mark, when you have a mark that actually has a comment on it or an, annotate, or an additional piece of information attached to it, the border around that mark changes from white to black. And as you can see when I go back to the timeline here, you can see that some of the marks have black outlines representing that they have a, um, a comment associated with them, and some of them have white outlines, which means that they do not. And here's a highlight of nothing. Um, now moving on to the video annotation window, uh, admin window. This is the window and the interface that researchers actually use to set up the, uh, the coding environment for their annotators. As you can see on the left, we have the list of all the variables that a researcher can put in. They can set the keyboard shortcut, the name, the color, and whether or not an event is ranged or it's a momentary event. Researchers are also able to drag and drop in multiple video streams so that you can have multiple angles or screen captures going on simultaneously. And in the bottom right-hand corner, we have a list of all the secondary data that was imported. This is, could be sensor data, this could be log data logged by a computer piece of software. And as you can see, you can set the color, whether or not you want that variable to be shown. You can also set whether or not you want that variable to be shown as a bar graph, a line graph, or a scatter plot. And you can also have a checkbox right above there that says whether or not you want these uh, variables to be stacked one on top of one another. VData is our tool for doing agreement calculations. This is a quick and dirty tool, but it meets the needs uh, greatly for researchers. The main area gives you all the data. It lists every single variable that that researcher had asked their coders to annotate. And we calculate agreement uh, by doing something called point-by-point -point agreement. We designate one coder as the primary coder and one coder as the secondary coder. Every, mo every mark that the primary coder makes, we call that an opportunity for agreement. For every mark that the secondary coder makes, we call, uh, that actually is a mark that the primary coder made as well, we call those actual agreements. And we do a simple percentage by taking the agreements over the opportunities. And as you can see, we provide the, the, all of the individual steps, all of the detail there in three different columns. Now, because we're looking at a lot of different data here, we're talking about momentary events as well as ranged events, the next three columns are the agreement calculations for ranged events following the exact same formula, and the last three columns are for comments or for the, the ranking systems that we ask the, co the coders to make as well. So we get agreement calculations for all the different aspects of the annotations that we made. Now, you might be asking yourself, hey, Josh, it's not inconceivable that two different people 
both observed the same thing, but their marks were off by a little bit. So would they be actually considered to have agreement? And this is why we added in a tolerance feature. This allows to us to have some wiggle room between the two different marks that the, that the coders made. So right now, we have a mark tolerance of one second which means the secondary coder's mark must be within half a second on either side of the primary coder's mark. Now, this number can easily be adjusted. This, there's up arrows, down arrows, and this is an edit editable text box. So the researchers can say, well, this is the, the tolerance. This is the wiggle room that we want to use for our research, whether it's one second, two seconds, three seconds. And in real time, the agreement calculations are adjusted. Researchers also have the opportunity to calculate overall agreement across all of the variables looked at in this individual session. What they can do is use the checkboxes on the left-hand side of the main window and select which variables they want to consider for total agreement. And as you can see down at the bottom, this field is dynamically updated. So we can see that of the variables that we're looking at, we had a 91% agreement and 100% agreement for calculating their duration. Now let's say that we ask the coders to annotate a variable but lots of variables of a small delta. So let's consider that smiles example that I keep on going back to. Let's say we ask them to put one mark down if they thought somebody was smirking, another mark down whether or not they thought they were just sort of grinning, and a third mark down for whether or not they had a big full grin and you could see their teeth. But let's say the agreement for each of those variables was something like 25%. Well, it's not inconceivable that coder A would categorize a certain smile as a grin, and coder B thought it as to be a full, big, open-toothed smile. So what we, what we facilitate here is a merge function that allows you to take all these variables, condense them into one, and treat all the marks as the same thing. And this allows you to say, well, maybe we were going too fine-grained with, with all these different variables, but when we look at it at a more coarse level, a higher level, we actually might have a higher agreement percentage. And when I discussed the requirements for a tool, one of the most important things was being able to resolve conflicts right away. And so we created this uh, compare uh, selected tracks button. What this does is it allows the researcher to select a bunch of tracks that may or may not have low agreement level and go directly into uh, looking at the video with those marks side by side. And that's the next picture. And as you can see here, what we've done is we've selected two different tracks, uh, and they get put in, right back into V-Code. You can see coder A and coder B both use the same color but different brightness levels. And we can see the marks side by side. And if you look carefully, you can see where coder A and coder B differ. And because this is directly synced with the video when having these resolution discussions, researchers can say, well, coder A, you didn't put a mark here. Why is that? And then you can say to coder B, well, you did. What did you see in the video here? And we can immediately go from the poor uh, agreement calculations to going directly back to the marks and the video so that it becomes a seamless process, a seamless cycle of making the annotations, reviewing the marks, and then checking out where these discrepancies occur. So when we look at the video annotation workflow that I discussed earlier, and we sort of hold vCode and vData up to the annotation workflow, we're, we can find out that vCode and vData actually handle very well points three, four, five, and actually part of six if you want to count agreement calculations in there, because sometimes you have to publish that, that data as well. And when we make the same concession that we did for all the other tools, which is that we have an interface for collecting and segmenting video, we, we take that, that data in, vCode and vData actually hit almost all six of those agreement points. And one of the exciting parts about vCode and vData is we allow for export at every stage of the process. So if you want to export data from vCode, you can do it into a comma-separated file. If you want to export data from vData, you can do it there. So no matter what, at any part of this process, if you have a better data analysis tool, if you have a better agreement tool, we allow you to take the data right out of our software and put it into someone else's so you can perform the analysis that you need to get done. So when we look back at the set of design requirements that we said an ideal tool should have, we find out that vCode and vData do all of them. Well, mostly all of the coding workflow, but it matches every other thing. We sync up our, our video annotations and guidelines. We capture all the different types of data, from momentary data to ranged events to allowing for comments or rankings. We um, say that we facilitate additional data to be displayed, and in our case, in line with the actual video. 
We have multiple forms of playback, the continuous mode, as well as play for three seconds, pause, and make a mark mode. We allow for easy agreement calculations, and when there's discrepancies and you need to review them, you can go right back to the video, right back to the marks between the different coders, and find out why those discrepancies occurred. VCode and VData were released for free on our website, and this has been about, uh, out for about two and a half months right now. And as you can see, we've had an amazing success with the number of downloads. The right-hand side is the, um, the download history. Uh, as of today, we have 6, over 6,400 downloads of our software. And in the next week or so, we're hoping to be releasing version 1.2. And as you can see, every time at, no, position, at mark number two and mark number three were when we had releases of new versions of the software. So we're hoping that with the next release, which is going to allow for uh, Cohen's Kappa calculations for agreement, which is another standard used for determining whether or not uh, the, the quality, the reliability of the data, we're hoping to see another bump in our downloads as well. But what does this mean in terms of future work? Where can we go from here? Because I'm sure you're at saying, vCode and vData seem like the perfect tool that I want to use in my own lab. Well, there's actually a little bit of room left to, to improve. As I mentioned, we're planning to include Cohen's Kappa in the next release, version 1.2. Also, allowing for network distribution of this system would be very, very nice. This means that an administrator or the researcher could set up a database of all the different videos that need to be annotated. And when a uh, coder logs into the system, it could just give them the next video that they need to work on. And they don't need to worry about finding which, where the file is, making a copy of it, putting their own marks in there as well. Now, with the advent of Android and the iPhone, everyone always asks, well, maybe you could do video annotation on your bus to work. So we're wondering maybe we could actually have a web interface or a phone interface to allow you to do these kind of annotations while you're, drive while you're driving somewhere. Please don't do this while you're driving. While you're on a plane, while you're on a bus, or taking a, a cruise, you know, because you really don't leave Google behind when you go on a cruise. Um, and lastly, um, researchers that we've talked to have started to ask for marking up on the screen. So actually being able to highlight areas with potentially a stylus or with their finger so that they can say, well, not only did I see somebody smile, but it was this person in the picture, and I put a circle around their face. Or this person, when they were looking at the screen, only their right eye was looking at the screen. So I could circle their right eye or write a little note. So this adds in a whole other element of the video annotation process, something that's not necessarily there for reliability, but allows marks to be made so that researchers, when they go back and rewatch the video, they can say, oh, yes, I observed this very interesting thing happening. At this point, I would like to thank Joey Hagedorn, who uh, was essential in getting this software to be built. He is one of the most talented programmers that I have ever known. Um, and I just need to thank him, because he's absolutely fantastic. I also need to thank my advisor, Kerry Kalaharios. I would like to thank NSF, whose grant uh, facilitated this research. And all of our subjects, collaborators, and researchers that we talk to to help design our set of requirements and workflow. And at this point, I'll take any questions. And I encourage everyone to go and download our software, at the very least, to help bump our numbers, if not to use it in your own lab. Thank you very much. Yes? Does the data come out in standard forms, like the time text maps or other lists? So the question is whether or not the data that gets uh, exported comes out in standardized form. Um, we were debating uh, when we were doing the export function on whether or not we wanted to embed it inside of the QuickTime files um, so they would be QuickTime tracks. But we decided to end up going with uh, comma-separated files as, as the method because. Uh, separated. Excuse me? At least use tag separated. Well, you can type commas. You don't want that. Right. Um, so the reason we ended up going with comma-separated, um, though easily that could be replaced with tab-separated with a small tweak to the code, is because many of the researchers that we spoke to, after they get the annotations, they end up having to import them into something like Stata, SPSS, or some kind of statistical package to look at overarching trends. And therefore, we wanted to make that as easy as possible. Um, that's a very good point as in terms of uh, either allowing it to be tab-separated in, in, in instead of commas or as an option. So we might look to trying to get that option to be put into the next iteration of our software. Right. And we completely ignored it. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but you, I mean, the other thing is you can then push that to the garage panel, so you can say, OK, this one's 
this one becomes the chance of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't even look at going in that direction, but um, I will definitely pass those comments along to Joey. And if he and or I are so inclined in the middle of our respective work, we might try to get that. It might. It probably won't be in 1.2, but it might make it into 1.3. There's, there's, there's a common case, which is I have a video that I this isn't as deep as your YouTube video. Mm -hmm. I want to chop the video off in segments and make, make a chapter list. Right. Um, Sure. So the comment that was made was that um, very often what uh, people might want to do is to chop up a video by putting these chapter markers in, and that allows you to sort of break up a video into easy segments. Um, we actually decided not to facilitate that function in our current tool, though we highly recommend doing that if you're going to do a, a large distributed management system. Because if you have QuickTime Pro, you can break down a video file into its small segments, save them as referenced movies so that it takes up minimal extra space, and then use those referenced movies in their own work. Um, but like you said, that, that breaking down function is, uh, is definitely a desired feature. And if we were to make the distributed management system, that would definitely be something that we would have to include, because that's sort of like the, the missing link in, in, in step one and step two of the annotation workflow. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. And once again, download vCode and vData. Thank you.